did it go? Was it? All right. Well, welcome back. So we were just talking about, uh, we are now finishing week six. So week six is um, almost halfway. Eight weeks is halfway. But this is always the time in the semester where you're tired. The excitement of school is um, dwindling or has dwindled already. <laughs> so um, this is where, um, because we're starting a new section, you know, second test is going to um, be coming up. Just kind of take a, take a minute to think about, all right, what could I do different? What worked, you know, when you were studying for your test, what worked? Um, what worked to get your homework in? Um, what can you do better? Um, you know, do you need to use the resources, the, the tutoring resources available to you, um, both on the NBC campus and then out here I'll, I'll, um, I'll be glad to stay after and, and work with you. Um, so just kind of take a, take a minute and think about what you can do different, what worked, what didn't work. And then try to gear yourself back up to finish um, to finish strong. Um, one thing I notice is that when students do really well and then they kind of fall off and then they panic and do, you know, kind of well at the end, their grade isn't where they wanted it to be. So just remember, slow and steady wins the race. So you just need to need to stay steady in your um, in your your studies and, you know, life in general. So um, if I can help you with that in any way, um, you know, I won't kick you in the rear, but, you know, I, I have had students that needed that, but I, I, I will not do that. Um, okay, so what we're going to do today, today is the third um, section that's due tomorrow, um, and there's only eight questions, and thankfully the eight questions that you're going to do for homework are exactly the same as what we're going to go over in class. Um, so you'll have an example. So I'm looking at page um, 99 in your packet. Let me share my screen. And um, any questions from Tuesday, adding like terms, um, the functions, being able to read the function, what it means, the f of x, and so on. Everyone feel good about all of that? Okay. And for those of you who got your homework in already, yay, thank you. That always makes my life easier because I don't have a million things to have to grade all at once. So. Okay, so what we're going to work on today is uh, linear functions. So remember, a linear function, gosh, I'm having a hard time seeing today. Um, all right, so a linear function is written like y equals mx plus b. This is your slope intercept format or 8x plus by equals c. Those are two forms, same thing. One is slope intercept form and one is in standard form. Um, those are linear equations. The way that you know it's a linear equation is because your x and your y both are to the first power. So that's how you know you, you have a linear equation. A linear equation, if you remember from graphing, always looks, you know, like a line. So it's, you can think of it as slow and steady. It has a very constant rise or it has a very constant fall. And it's going to be the same throughout. So it's, it's not going to go up and down. Um, like other functions. It's going to be very steady as far as how fast it goes up or how fast it goes down. So when we're dealing with linear functions, what you want to look at is before, right, when we were graphing a line, we were looking at the slope in terms of physical, right? It was a physical rise and run, rise and run. Now what we're going to do is now we're going to look at functions, linear functions, where the slope is how things are changing. So for instance, if I said that my, um, that my grocery bill is linear in relation to how much it's rising, and let's say it's rising $5 per month, okay? And that is a very small number compared to what it actually is. <laughs> Um, I think inflation is like 8% right now. Um, so if it rises $5 a month, 
that means every month it's going to go up. So if my first month is $10, my second month is going to be 15. My third month is going to be 20. My fourth month is going to be 25 and so on. So what this does is it allows us to go, okay, how much is it going to be in my 10th month? Well, if you notice, all I'm doing is I'm adding five to each month. So on my 10th month, if I start at 10, it's going to be about 60 because 50 more dollars, right? $5 every month, 10 months is 50 plus the 10 that where we started. Okay, so you're able to um, interpret or predict what is going to happen in the future. And linear is will work every single time because it's constant. It has a constant rise in the amount um, with every change that you make. You know what the change is. Okay, so you can look at linear functions in different ways. Um, this first one, remember proportion is when you have, you know, A over B equals C over D, and then you cross multiply and divide by your third number. That's the proportion. So this is an A. Um, so if we were going to set this one up as a proportion, um, it would be, so one gallon of gas costs 250. So one gallon so as a proportion, I'm running out of room already. One gallon is to cost of 250. And we want to know how much will it cost to fill 15 gallons. So remember with the proportion, you want to keep it top to bottom the same. So gallons to dollar amount, gallons to dollar amount. Okay. And then to solve that, we just diagonally multiply. So this takes us back to, it was one of the first, I think it was uh, homework one or two um, in proportion. So if you need to refer back to that, you can. Um, so it's uh, 250 times 15 divided by one. So the dollar amount is going to be 37.50. Okay. That's a seven, not a two. Thirty-seven dollars fifty cents. Okay. As a conversion, so remember conversion. So this was um, like the unit conversions. They want you to change from gallons to dollars. Gallons to dollars. So with this one, it's going to be um, two fifty. Do it over here. Two fifty. So there's our dollars to one gallon and we have 15 gallons. So we want to find out how much it is with 15 gallons to how much money. Okay, so if you notice, you're still multiplying 250 times 15. So you're still getting 3750. So what this is showing is that there's different ways to set up the equations. Now, you can't always use proportions, um, and you can't always use conversions, um, but you can always use a linear function. Okay, so the linear function, just straight, is for uh, 250 a gallon, and we have 15 gallons. So you can see three different ways you get the exact same answer, just different setup. And then D says, explain in your own words why they all give the same answer. Well, you're just multiplying dollar amount times gallon. That's what you're doing is multiplying the two values. No matter how you set it up, you end up multiplying the two values. <clears throat> so depending on what you're being asked will determine how you're going to set up your your um, your function. 
So if you like proportions and you want to stick to that, you're more than welcome to do that. If you like the conversions and you want to stick to that, you can do that. Or if you want to just set up the new function. So it just gives an idea that there's um, different ways. Okay, everyone good? Um, all right, so look at the cost per credit hour at NVC versus UTSA. I already did that. So at NVC, we have $109 per credit hour. And at UTSA, this just kills me. It kills me why people would do this. It's 500 about, because it went from like 485 to 525 per credit hour. Now, here's the crazy thing. Because you guys are making a correct choice, a, a financially responsible choice by, by doing um, community college, they have this exact same class at UTSA. So as a freshman, you can take this, this exact same class, same everything, same material, same concepts, everything, and you would sit in a room with 300 people. Yeah, so that's usually the freshman classes. They're in like a stadium. You never talk to the instructor. You uh, There are um, graduate level aides that help out and they do all the grading for the professor. And um, it's pretty, um, and uh, what's the term I'm looking for? You, you don't, there's not, it's not real personal. So plus you're paying almost five times what you would um, for the exact same thing. So you guys are doing it right. You're, you're being financially responsible. All right, so how much would it cost just to take 12 credit hours at each school? So if we are doing this just linearly, you have $109 times 12 for UTSA, it would be 500 times 12. And it's linear because every time you add a credit hour, it's gonna go up $109 at NBC, it's gonna go up $500 at UTSA. So at NBC, one semester is about $1,308. Compared to UTSA, 500 times 12 is about 6,000 for the exact same classes. Now, granted, at UTSA, you know, you probably live on campus. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe you live on campus. Um, but what this does not take into account is the cost of books, the cost of gas, the cost of food. What else? Housing. This is only tuition. So that amount, usually with all everything else, it can at least double. So could you imagine having to come up with $12,000 a semester for, for at UTSA? So yeah, it is crazy. And it, what's, what's interesting is my, my all three of my kids went to college. My oldest one went to a four-year university and it was private, so it was expensive. Um, and we didn't have money. We didn't have tuition set aside. That was not something that we thought about. Um, and my middle son went one year to a community college and then transferred out here to Shriner. And his just that one year, he, he was able to pay off all of his student loans, where my other two kids who went right to university did not. So, and those were the years that, you know, you have to get a, a, a degree, you have to get a degree. And now they're kind of falling back to, it, the pendulum has kind of swung back to, well, you, do you really need a degree to run a business? No, do you really need a degree to do certain things? There are certain things absolutely you need a degree for, but um, not not everything. Work hard, that's that's the key, just work hard. I'm, I'm starting to notice the, uh, the green up on my whiteboard. <laughs> 
whoever teaches in here. Okay, here we go. Everyone good with that one? So that one was pretty straightforward. Um, again, it's linear because it, it changes at a constant rate. All right, so Mr. Thompson is on a diet. The graph below shows his weight over time. So if you look at the horizontal line, those are the months, so months one through 10. The vertical line is the, the weights by 20. So always, whenever you're reading the graph, always stop and kind of look to see what is it that I'm looking at? What, what are the, the values um, on the horizontal and the vertical? So how much did he weigh when he started the diet? So that is at month zero. So what's, what's the weight? 260, perfect. Okay. And then it asks, how much did he lose every month? So we're going to do this just visually and give it a good guess. And then I'm going to show you algebraically how you can find that. So what guess? What would your guess be? Five, about five pounds? Okay, so we're going to guess about five pounds. Okay, so uh, it went... Uh, started at 260, month one, he dropped a little bit and it's hard to read exact, right? Month two, he dropped a little bit more and it is consistent. Month three, he dropped a little bit more. Month four, almost to 240 and month five, right at 240. So mathematically, the best way to do this is to find your rise and your run. Find your slope, because remember slope is how much change every month. Well, we have a downhill slope, so we know that our slope is negative, which makes sense because he's decreasing his weight. So negative slope means it's decreasing. And then he did, so from 240 to 260 is 20 pounds. And over a course of five months. So five pounds was a great guess but 20 divided by five is four pounds per month. So to find how much every month, you just find two points that are exact on your graph and you find the rise over the run, you find your slope. So he is losing about four pounds per month. Okay. So here is where you're going to set up a linear equation. Okay. So we're estimating now. Well, we could estimate, you know, we know he's losing four pounds and you can, you know, kind of list all the numbers at 10, at 10 months, he weighed 220 minus four, minus four, minus four, minus four. That is a lot of work to, <laughs> to uh, guess at. So we're going to do this algebraically. <clears throat> He started at 260 pounds. That's the fixed amount. He loses four pounds per month. And he wants to be 198 pounds. So whenever you're setting up your, um, your linear equation, there's going to be a fixed amount, a starting amount. And then your slope is how much is, how much is changing. That's your variable amount. Okay, and now you're going to solve for x. You're going to use your algebra skills to solve for x. Okay, now whenever you're doing, whenever you're working with um, uh, linear equations, you always want to make sure that you know. You always want to pay attention to what do the variables represent. So our x, right? So we looked at it at the beginning. Our x is the number of months. 
our y is the weight. Okay. So what this means is after about 15 and a half months, if he's consistent, losing four pounds every month, after 15 and a half months, he'll be about 190. Okay, right, so just a little bit, like what, a year and a quarter about? Okay, right? and that's a healthy, that is a healthy, two to four pounds is a healthy weight loss. It's the people that lose 30 pounds in, you know, a month. You go, nah, it's not fast. <laughs> that is way <laughs> enough. <laughs> yes, it will, plus some, always. Okay, all right, so any questions on that one? Reading a graph, being able to find the slope on the graph, and then um, setting up an, uh, a linear equation. All right, here we go. Uh, Kara uses the linear model f of x equals 20,000 plus 0.3x to predict her total salary from achieving total sales of x. Interpret the slope and the y-intercept in terms of her salary and sales. So we have this linear equation, right? The 20,000. So any linear equation is going to be set up this way. It has a fixed amount plus a variable amount. So the fixed amount is fixed, right? There's It's a number all by itself. It's what you're going to... Um, you know, get no matter what. The variable amount means it varies. It changes depending on what it is that you're that you're looking at. So in this case, your X is represented by the total sales. And your F of X, which remember is your Y, it's just another way to say Y, is, um, Is it? Oh, salary, sorry, total salary. In other words, how much she makes. Okay, so let me ask you this. If she makes zero sales, what is her salary going to be? 20,000. Because if you plug in zero for X, 0.3 times zero, there's your zero. Zero plus 20,000 is 20,000. So 20,000 is what's called the base salary or the starting salary. Okay, so that fixed amount is always where it starts. If you noticed, I'm gonna scroll back up. If you noticed on the graph, the 260 was your fixed amount. That was when uh, the months were zero. So that y-intercept is gonna be your fixed amount. Okay, that's where your equation or where your graph crosses the, the y-axis, that's your y-intercept. So fixed amount is always gonna be the y-intercept, okay? The point three is your slope. So the slope is your variable amount. Okay, variable amount. So if you have a variable amount, point three, what that means is that if they sell $1 of sales, what is 0.3 times one? Not a trick question. <laughs> it's 0.3, right? So here's what that means. If I sold $1 worth of material or uh, sales, I'm only going to make 30 cents of that $1. That's what that means. So in other words, you can also change this to a percentage. I get 30%. So 30% of the sales. That's what that 0.3 represents. For every dollar, I make 30 cents. Two dollars, I make 60 cents. Three dollars, I make 90 cents. Four dollars, I make 
a dollar twenty. Okay, so so when you break sales down, um, a lot of times, uh, like my son, he only does uh, by commission, so he wouldn't get that base salary. He only makes commission on what he sells. Okay, so the slope is the variable amount. It's the thirty percent of the sales. Any questions on that one? So just remember the slope is always going to be your variable amount. The y-intercept is always going to be your y-intercept, your beginning amount. Mm -hmm. All right. So just to just to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page, what if you sold? What if you sold? $10,000 worth of product, what would your salary be? Okay, so if you sell so I'm going to use, remember, I'm going to use functional notation. So this says, take out my X and plug in 10,000. So 20,000, what was the number you said? Yep. So 0.3 times 10,000 is 3,000. So your total, your total salary would be $23,000. So another way to write this, remember, is when X is 10,000, Y is 23,000. So when you sell $10,000 worth of material, you get a check for 23,000. Minus taxes, don't forget taxes. <laughs> the reality, right? All right, here we go. Uh, Joe has a part-time job caring for and walking dogs. Yay, we made it to page 100. Um, he estimates that his annual insurance is $420. So whenever you're looking at these, when you're doing your homework, what I want you to do is I want you to look for the fixed amount and the variable amount. That's Those are the always the two things that you want to look for. Fixed means it's set. It's what you start with. Variable means that's that's uh, usually variable amount. You'll see the word per, you know, per sales, per month, per gallon, per visit. That's how you kind of can can hone in on the variable amount. Okay, so his in, uh, annual insurance, et cetera, is four hundred twenty dollars. On average, he spends four dollars and fifty cents on gallon per visit. He charges fifteen dollars per visit. Note that this is an annual cost function. Explain how to find the cost function. So for A, we're looking for the fixed amount. So which one do you think is the fixed amount? 420, good. Okay, because that's not going to change. Fixed amount means it's not going to change. If you don't even do one visit, it's still going to cost you 420 bucks. And then what's the variable amount? Which one? Okay, the gasoline. Why not the 15? Because they're both per visit. Okay, so that's the key. He spends 450 per visit. He charges 15 per visit. So spending and charging are two completely different um, functions. So we're looking at just his cost. So we're looking at how much does he spend. We're not looking at how much does he make. Because if he charges $15 per visit, that's how much he makes. That would be his revenue. So this is something that that I, I just love when they throw stuff in here to see if you catch it. Okay, so we have a fixed amount of 420. We have a variable amount of 450 per visit. This part right here is extra information that you do not need. 
because we're not talking about costs. We're only talking about, I mean, sorry, we're not talking about revenue. We're only talking about cost. I probably shouldn't put an X there. I should probably put something. <laughs> the red lines are there. It's just extra information to see if it'll throw you off. Okay. All right, so our cost function, we're gonna do it this way. I'm just labeling it, capital C is 420 plus 450 times X. So now take your time. You, should, you can use your calculator and fill in that, that chart, that table. I'll give you a minute. So with this one, you could have done it a couple different ways. You could have used the cost function or you just add 450 every single time. But zero is 420, one visit, 420, 450, two visits, 429, three visits, 43350, and four visits, 438. Okay, so if X is X, then your cost function would be 420 plus 0.45 or 4.5x. All right. So suppose his budget, so this is C, suppose his budget is $1,000. How many visits could he make annually? So this is where knowing what your variables represent will really, really help you with word problems. We know the X represents the number of visits, right? So we want to make sure that we write this. The X equals the number of visits. The C of X is our total cost. So where is that thousand going to go? With the X or the C of X? The C of X, good. So it's going to be 1,000 equals 420 plus 4.5x. Okay, so always just plug and know what your variables represent 
and then plug in whatever value they give you into the right spot. And then you're at a two-step equation. So 128.9, does that sound right? So how many visits? He can make 128 visits. And the reason why you round down on this one is because if he does 129 visits, that means he's gonna be over budget. So that's where sometimes you have to round to make it fit the, the word problem. 128, he will be under budget. 129 is going to be over budget, so we're going to make it 128 visits. Okay, no problems? All right, class is going to go fast today. Um, number six, in meteorology, the temperature is related to the altitude by the formula T of H equals negative 3.5H plus 58.6, where H, this is huge right here, where H is in thousands of feet. Mark it. The T is the temperature. Okay. So what that means is you have an H value, which is in thousands. Okay. So the slope, that negative 3.5, what does that represent? Like, how would you explain what the slope is? So it's negative. So first things first, if it's negative, is it going, is the temperature going up or down? It's going down, okay? And it's going down three and a half degrees for every thousand feet, right? Three and a half degrees for every thousand feet. Okay, so if it says that H is already in thousands and we have 12,000 feet, what you're going to do is you're going to divide this number by a thousand because it's already set in the, in the formula as in thousands. So if you put in 12,000 for the H, because it's height, what you're saying is it's 12,000 times a thousand. So now that means you're 12 million feet, okay? So be very cognizant of it, what the variable is in. If it's in thousands, then you're gonna divide by a thousand. If it's in hundreds, then you're gonna divide by a hundred to get the value that you need, okay? So the slope is, uh, let's see, temperature goes down 3.5 degrees per um, thousand feet. Okay, so now B says, what should the temperature, if the height is 12,000 feet? So we're looking for the temperature when H is 12. So let me give you an example. If I did um, negative 3.5 times 12,000 plus the 58.6, I'd end up with, if I did it at 12,000, 
I end up with negative two, four, six, one, two, zero, zero. That is an extremely cold temperature, right? So remember with all of these, your answers have to make sense. So if you ever do this and you just automatically put in 12,000 or put in the, the, the value um, without noticing what the H is in, you're gonna get an answer that's gonna be completely screwy. So remember your answer should always make sense. So the temperature at 12,000 feet should be 16.6 .6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that makes more sense, right? At 12,000 feet, that's pretty high. The highest I've been, let's see, what is the highest I've been? I've been in um, California and Yosemite up on uh, the dome. I hiked that. I actually wear that, did you guys, well, sometime this summer, the girl and her dad were coming off of it because a thunderstorm was coming and she fell, slipped and fell. That spot right there, I know exactly where she was. It, it's steep. You have cables and these boards that go across and if it's wet, it gets slick. Yeah, that was very sad. I can't imagine. She No, she was an adult. Yeah, she was an adult. Was that a different? It, I mean, yeah. it could have been a different. Yeah. Wow. At, at Half Dome or someplace. Yeah. It's sad. We, uh, where I used to live, there was this place called um, Fraser Falls, and it was 180 feet down. And my husband and I and my brother and his wife were hiking, and we were standing there talking to this older couple. And I turned around and walked away. And my husband went, no, and I turned back around and the man was sliding over the side and he ended up dying. It was horrible. It was horrible. He broke his neck. It was so awful. But not one of the better days of my life. Okay, next one. Sorry, that was that was a downer. Um, at what height will the temperature be? 32 degrees. So again, notice what you're looking for. You're looking for H. So really keeping in mind what your variables represent really helps you know where to put the values. On B, we were looking for the temperature. They were given the height. Now we're looking for the height given the temperature. So the temperature is 32. So negative 3.5, we're looking for H. So now you're gonna use your, your untangle skills, your algebra skills, to get the H by itself. All right, so does that make sense? 7.6 feet? What's wrong with that answer? So 7.6 is correct, but it's not written in thousands. Okay, so this is where you go back to this in thousands. So we're going to multiply this by a thousand and we get our 7,600. Okay, so we have to be able to go back and forth. You have to change when you're given thousands, change it back, dividing by 100. When you're given the decimal, you change it back by multiplying by a thousand. 
And that that's probably the one place that, that catch a lot of students on tests is in homework, because they forget to switch it back and forth. Or don't even notice that part. All right, any questions on that one? Zoom people, you're good. Awfully quiet. No raised hands today. Okay, number seven. So in 1990, Americans ate out at a restaurant an average of 143 times. By the year 2000, this had reached 170 meals out a year. If there is constant growth, so that, that's how you know it's linear. Constant growth means it's a linear equation. How many meals a year do you expect us to eat out in 2030? So this is one of those you're able to um, predict what's gonna happen. So here's how these work. In 1990, it was 143 times. So what I'm doing is I'm setting up an order pair. So those two numbers go together. In 1990, 143 meals. In 2000, it was 170 meals. So the reason why we're setting up order pairs is because we need to find the slope. You need to find what is that constant growth. So constant growth is linear, but what we're looking for is the slope. So the way we find the slope is we use the slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So anytime you're having to find a growth rate or a decay rate or a, um, uh, a reduction rate, you're looking for your slope. So now slope is no longer linear. It's no longer a physical line. Now slope is how things change. Okay, so now we're going to use our two ordered pairs. So we have y minus y over x minus x. So we have 27 over 10. 2.7. Anyone want to try and interpret that for me? What's 2.7? What is that? Is that the what? So 2.7, yeah, keep it at 2.7. But what does the 2.7 represent? Um, but we're talking about meals per year. So if you did 27 meals over 10 years, right, that's how much it's it's grown. It is growing. So we are, yeah, so it's 2.7 meals per year increase because it's positive. If this was a negative number, that means that the number of meals per year would be going down. But because it's positive, that means that we're increasing 2.7 meals every year. So with that, if we have 2.7 meals a year, <clears throat> in, 30, uh, in 2030, right? That's what we're looking for. How many meals a year will, do you expect us to eat in 2030? So we started at 170, I'm sorry, 143. And there's 43 years, I'm sorry, 40 years. So from 1990, sorry, from 2030 to 1990 is 40 years. So if it's 2.7 every year, this one's going to make you think. It's 2.7 every year for 40 years. That's how many meals it increases by. It's 
So after 40 years, we have 108 more meals. And we started at 143 and we added 108 meals. So in the year 2030, it's uh, 251 meals. Yes, that's in the year 2030. Mm -hmm. So in the year 2030, you would expect that the families would uh, have 251 meals out of a year. Okay, so how could we write this in a linear equation? What 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 could we do? What did we start with? Put it this way. So remember the idea of the fixed and the variable? What would the fixed amount be? What did we start with? 143, good. And what would the variable be? Yep, 2.7 per year. So that is our linear equation. And so if we use that, you can see I did 2.7 times 40. So right here, 2.7 times 40. And then I added 143. So a lot of times what happens is people don't use like the algebra setup, but you really are doing algebra. I tell my husband that all the time. I go, you do algebra every single day because anytime you're looking for an unknown, anytime you're looking for a distance, anytime you're looking for the number of lights that you have to put in, that is algebra. You may not set it up algebraically, but you're still doing the process. So this is our linear equation, fixed and variable. And that's what you always wanna look for is fixed and variable. All right. Real life ex a situation with a variable cost and a fixed cost. Anyone have anything? An idea? An example? Zoom people, you can type type one in for me. Say that again. Car payment. Yep. Good. Car payment and and, and insurance because car payment. <clears throat> is fixed. Well, that could be variable too, because it depends on how many months you pay. Mm -hmm. Insurance is variable because it's um, uh, every month. So what would be, in, in that case, what would be a fixed cost? No, because that's every month. Anytime you have to pay it periodically, that would be a variable. So fixed, think of fixed as it's it's a one lump sum. Yeah, yeah. So like a down payment, that's a fixed cost. It's what you put down no matter what. And then the variable is when you pay periodically. Yep. Good. Okay. Anyone have a, a different one? Okay. Yep. So Jonathan said a credit card, you have to pay a certain amount for the year. And then every month you're paying. One of these days, if we have time, we might have time. We we'll have to come up with it. Um, just showing you uh, the realities of the credit card, the minimum payment, you will never pay your credit card off. And it's designed that way because that's how they make interest is when you don't pay it off each month. So there's nothing wrong with credit cards, just pay them off each month. Okay, last two. Uh, bacteria population doubles every minute. Explain why this population growth cannot be modeled using a linear equation. So I'm gonna show you this. This is actually quite astounding. So I'm gonna change the scenario. We're not gonna talk bacteria, we're gonna talk money. So let's say you go to your job and your boss says, okay, I can give you a fixed salary or we can start you at a dollar 
on the first day, and then we double it every day after for 30 days. Would you rather have the fixed salary, say 100,000, or would you rather have the doubling? Okay, tell me why. Okay, I won't double the whole thing. I'll just show it to you. Okay, so we started out with one, we doubled it, we get two. We double it, we get four. We double it, we get eight. We double it, we get 16. We double it, we get 32. We double it, we get 64. Do you see how all of a sudden the numbers are really taken off? Okay, and then, so this is the pattern. This is two to the zero power. Anything to the zero power is always one. This is two to the first power is two. Two to the second power is four. Two to the third power is eight. Two to the fourth power is 16. Two to the fifth power is 32. Sixth power is 64. Seventh power is 128. And two to the eighth power is 256. So now if we continue this on down, what would two to the 30th power yeah, it's a big old fat number. I would love to have that amount. So here it is. It's one zero seven three seven four one eight two four. On my calculator. So you you punch in. You have this calculator, right? So you do. Yeah. So do two, and then the little hat, and then thirty and then hit enter. So it's, what is that? One billion, right? Yeah, one billion, 73 million, 741,824. Man, that would be nice. In 30 days? Yeah, yeah. I would love to be able to talk someone into doing that. So, but yeah. Um, so what this is called, this is called exponential growth. So what it looks like, so you know how linear growth, down here, linear growth, so you guys can actually see it. <laughs> linear growth is just steady, right? It's a constant. It just kind of keeps on going at a steady pace. Nothing wrong with that. Exponential growth looks like this. It starts out slow, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and then it really starts growing. And we're going to see this um, with finances. If you invest, exponential growth works. If you have a credit card, <laughs> exponential growth is going to be your detriment. If you have student loans, exponential growth is going to be to your detriment. So it works both ways. If you invest, exponential, exponential growth works great. But if you're um, in debt, the exponential growth will be uh, a stranglehold on you. So that's the difference. Linear is just a constant growth rate. Exponential growth, it starts out slow and then it goes uh, faster. So the, the reason that a population doubling every minute is because it is not a constant growth or decrease or growth rate. Okay. So a constant growth rate is a line, linear, exponential. This doubling idea is exponential. Okay. All right, last one. So this last one, I don't know if it's my packet. Do you guys have your packet? Can you tell me what your answer is on number 10 on page 100? Because I was working on this this morning and I noticed that in the packet, in my packet, the answer says three liters, but the question is in quarts, but it doesn't ask you to change it to liters. So I don't, 
my answer that I got is not what they have in the back of the book. What does yours say? It does say three liters? Okay. Um, Daniel, that one, um, the one that we're working on, number 10, This, these are just examples for the homework that you're going to do. Homework, I think it's homework 12. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to do this one. I think the one in the back of the book is incorrect because like I said, it's, it's giving your answer in liters and it doesn't ask for liters. It asks for quarts. So, and I did it three times. So I'm going, all right, I, I know I'm doing it right. All right, here we go. So we have, um, so this is a mixture problem. So go back to the mixtures if you're not, if you're not sure how to set them up but I'll do it right here. So remember we have our little table chart. It's just, for me, this is just the easiest way for me to, to set it up. So we always have the amount here, the percent here, and then you're gonna go amount times percent here. And then we have item one, which was your milk. And we had, what was it? Uh, one quart at 3%. So one quart at 3%. So remember, you're changing it to a decimal. So then we multiply one times 0 0.03 is 0 0.03. And then the question was, how much water do we want to add? So we don't know how much water we're adding. Obviously, water has 0% fat, so we know that that's zero there. And the question says, how much water do we add in order to get 2% milk fat? Okay, so before, we would put a P right here and write the equation. Right now, we know what the P is. We don't know what we're adding, so we're adding 1 plus X. Put that in parentheses and it's gonna equal 0 0.03. So remember, you're adding down and multiplying across. Okay, so there is your function. So you have one plus X times 0 0.02, keep that terms, 0 0.02 equals Point zero three. Okay. So now it's just a matter of distributing. So point zero two times one is point zero two. Point zero two times x is point zero two x equals point zero three. Now you're just going to solve it. negative. So you're going to subtract 0 0.02. <clears throat> and then divide by 0 0.02. You should get 0.5. So what that means is I'm adding, <clears throat> adding one half quart of water, which means we have 1.5 quarts of water, I'm sorry, of liquid. And that is 2% milk fat. Now, because I was, I was looking at that answer, I go, okay, I'm gonna make sure that I'm doing this right. So if I did 1.5 times P, equals 0 0.03. So let's say I don't, I wanna make sure that that is 2%. So if I do it this way, I get my P equals 0 0.02. So 
So I know I did it right. So I'm not sure what that answer is for. But I don't think it's for your homework. Yeah, so the homework one is gallons. So I don't know where the leader one came from. I'll have to I'll have to ask the people that type these up. Okay. All right. So here's your homework. Your homework is on page 101, 102. It is eight, the first eight questions, or it's the eight questions. And they are identical to the ones we just did. So all you have to do is go through, fill it out. Um, I don't think there's there's a couple explanation ones. Interpreting the y-intercept, finding slope, um, reading a graph, and then again, finding slope and then the mixture problems. So that is it for today. So I am more than welcome to stay if you guys want to do your homework now, to stay and get it done, or if you have a life and need to get home, Make sure you do your homework at home, okay? Right. So you have three things and a quiz due tomorrow. And our next test is October 29th. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome.